So yeah, my, my presentation is going to be very different. I'm not showing any demos. I'm not uh, teaching you the framework. I'm here to share my own experience and the experiences of uh, our team as we migrated a rather large project or rather a set of projects applications into Azure during this year, in 2018. So it's fresh from the press. We just migrated in October. And I'm here to speak about that with you. Uh, a bit about my background. I'm a software developer, so I'm talking from perspective of a software developer, not IT guy or not architect. Uh, my other patients, patients are functional programming, F-sharp, serverless. So that's what we can talk after the hours <coughs> about. And I'm Azure MVP, which is just just a title. Um, in my previous life, like seven, six years ago, I lived in Russia, St. Petersburg. I worked as a software developer, as a freelancer, basically, doing contracts for, for European customers, mostly. So very relaxed pace, no, no fixed schedule, no meetings at all. And then one day that changed. Uh, I moved to the Netherlands to work for, for a large corporation, or rather a branch of large corporation called Qualcomm. You might have heard of Qualcomm. If you don't, then probably in your mobile phone you have at least one chip from Qualcomm. Or otherwise, you pay, they pay the royalty to Qualcomm because they have lots of patents and for stuff like mobile and CDMA. But immediately, I felt like I'm, I'm in a big corporation. And of course, you feel it mainly by attending a lot of meetings. One of those meetings was uh, an IT meeting where developers, like myself, were sitting on the table. And then on the other side, there were IT guys. And then once a week or so, we would talk to each other, and they would report how our applications are, are doing in production, like what kind of issues they, they get from us, from our code. And then we would explain them what they can uh, expect from the next version, and like what are the new issues coming on the pipeline. So we would extend that talk. And I remember one vivid example. There was a discussion whether we should buy another SQL Server. Uh, our application is hard on SQL Server, several clusters, as you will see. And uh, it's using sharding to spread the load, but it, apparently this wasn't enough. The performance wasn't great, so they were talking whether they can buy another SQL Server to help this. And that's a big thing, because first you need to order it through Qualcomm. Like It takes three or four months before you get the hardware. And then uh, on top of that, you, you just have to buy the license for SQL Server. Of course, it's SQL Server Enterprise, which costs like $7,000 per core. So it's like buying a new house, uh, that, that kind of estimates. And then when you get it, you still don't have administrative permissions for that server, because it's managed by Qualcomm. And if you need to do something real with it, you need to call a DBA who sits somewhere in California. And then he can set up some scripts for you or change permissions, uh, that, that kind of environment. Fast forward to today, if I knew a new SQL server in Azure Cloud, I write JSON like this. That's actual copy paste from, from our JSON definition. Then I put it into Git. Then I'm, if I'm brave enough, I, I I click a button somewhere in a, a continuous integration. And then after several minutes, I will get the same SQL Server, kind of same SQL Server running in Azure. So that's one example of the transformation that we, we went through. Of course, it will not be useful at that point. You have to install stuff and, and so on. But it's so much easier these days. Uh, so the plan for, for, for the presentation is that we'll start with context, like explain how we, where we were before then how the decision to migrate to Azure was made. And then the main details would be in the implementation and the transition period of this year. And then a brief summary of lessons learned by our team. Just a quick show of hands. Who has some idea about Azure services, used it in some way? Uh, yeah, most of you. OK, that, that helps. I will not explain everything in details, because I don't have time. <coughs> But basically, we start with context. So what we had before, basically last year and before. Uh, first, the Qualcomm days were over about three years ago when they sold this division to a company called Astrata. That's what, what you saw in the abstract. So it's actually Astrata, not Qualcomm. And it's not a huge corporation. And it doesn't have that much money. They also don't have all those processes and meetings. But uh, the money thing is uh, important. 
because we kind of got all the hardware and licenses for Qualcomm, like that's that's yours, go something with it. But then you still need to support it in the data center. You pay for renewals and so on. So uh, if I just to, were to explain the business in one slide, uh, Astrata, our previous Qual that branch of Qualcomm, we were doing <coughs> fleet management. So we were, you know all the trucks and vehicles going on the roads, big trucks with, with containers or with trailers. <coughs> A uh, truck is basically a network of device inside of it. It has a uh, like onboard computer, it has sensors and tires, uh, some data about fuel consumption, some data about data behavior, driver behavior. So it collects all the data from, from different parts of truck. And then we, as a strata or Qualcomm, install a device inside which listens for this data, collects some insights, and then every minute or so sends it to the backend. Like how much fuel was burned, or what the driver did wrong, or so that kind of thing. What's the temperature in, in the container? Then my team kicks in. We basically do the backend stuff. We get this data, we process it, try to get some more insights from it, save it to the database. And then there is a nice website uh, with Web API, uh, RESTful API. And then the dispatchers of those companies can get the data in usable format, make business decisions. Of course, they pay for that black box that we sell them, and then they pay for services a monthly thing or something like that. Uh, just in order of magnitude, we have like 40,000 trucks in Europe running on roads, and then we get about yeah, several hundred messages per second from, from those trucks. Uh, just a s quick sketch of, of what, what parts we have in the application. We have servers, web servers, which talk to backend and frontend. Uh, all the data processing is asynchronous, so we put all the data into a queue first, and then there is someone listening to this queue, processing the data. And then it puts data into database, which is always SQL Server. And there is another API, which is not shown here, uh, to talk to front-end application of, of the user. So I'll kind of digest uh, the migration on, on this part. Uh, the application, all. all all servers were located in a data center. That means that you buy hardware, uh, you give it to somebody, a data center vendor or operator, and it runs them 24-7, power supply, conditioner, networking, and so on. So the breakdown of responsibilities looks a little bit like this. Uh, you own everything, but they run for you hardware, power, storage, and networking. If something doesn't work, you, you cannot fix it by yourself because it's physically somewhere in their data center. You have to call them and contact support, uh, make a ticket or something. And on top of that, everything is yours. Like you have to install operation system, or us, our, our IT guys have to. Then you put runtime, any third party software that you use. You have to do backups yourself. You have to manage data, redundancy, consistency, whatever. And of course, on top of that, you put applications. So quite, quite a lot of things, but also not enough power to do low-level stuff like, uh, for example, if we need to open a firewall port, we need to call vendor. We cannot do it ourselves. <clears throat> so in the, in the subtitle of my presentation, I said about one million hardware. Uh, I cannot give you the exact number, because that's commercial secret second nobody knows. Uh, but just in order of magnitude, uh, about 40 or 60 physical servers, then a lot of networking, load balancers, switches. SAN is a network storage, very expensive thing which runs several dozens of SSD, and then it's accessible via a fiber channel from databases. It gives you huge performance, but also costs like a lot. Uh, SQL Server licenses, as I said, are a big, big part of it. And then you pay every year, you pay to a vendor uh, of uh, data center and your own IT to run all this. So that was all before this year. And that was quite expensive, too expensive, so that Astrata was looking how to reduce this cost. So there were several kind of drivers uh, for, for the migration, yes? Yeah, very considerable part, yes. Uh, probably less than half, but like 30% or something. 
So it, it also has some third party other software, not SQL. But also Windows and uh, whatnot. Did you bring your mic to the crew editor as well? Uh, no, but that will be later. No. Uh, so the decision, uh, there were several factors in, in the decision, but the main one, of course, money, so the biz from the business. Uh, this year, a lot of hardware which we got from Qualcomm was about to end of life, which means it kind of works, but it, nobody will support it, and then nobody wants to, to work with that. So you can buy a lot of cheap servers after the end of life for Bitcoin <laughs> or I don't know. Uh, so there was a decision whether we do large investment and buy a new hardware for a few years, or we try to migrate away from it. And of course, when you own your hardware, that means you cannot innovate fast if you want to run a new application and you have to go the full cycle for, of buying new servers every time. Your time to market is large and then business feels that, that you cannot iterate fast enough. So that's additional money. But on the other hand, everything works. So in order to do any migration, you would have to direct your engineers from ongoing product work and make them fix your code to be able to run it somewhere else, like Azure or uh, any other cloud. So that's a bit of trade-off. For IT, from IT perspective, they never liked that uh, uh, data center vendors because they didn't get full control o over the environment. So cloud, in a sense, gives them more power because they do pretty much everything on the level that cloud provides. But of course, it builds on, on a lot of things that you cannot control in the cloud. Like you don't know where it runs, how it's physically configured, and so on. So you, are, you get some control, you lose the other one. Uh, the big pro of cloud is that you can spin up multiple environments. We used to have like production and staging, and that's about it. Alpha was kind of small and uh, rough. But in the cloud, you can create a dozen environments by just automating enough things and then shut them down when you don't need them. Also, if you have only one data center, there is no basic disaster recovery. You put your data somewhere in a different place, but that's it. If, if like the whole data center blows up, it's close to end of business, kind of. Probably will take multiple weeks before, before we are really up again. So that, again, it's much easier in, in the cloud. And from developer's perspective, it's yeah, fun to play with cloud, all the services that you have, not only SQL Server that you had before. Uh, you can leverage the elasticity of the cloud, so scale up or down based on load, not based on predictions. You can automate everything, as I shown with uh, JSON. And then uh, I love playing with performance, optimizing things uh, to make them faster. And if you are in the cloud, if you optimize something, you can save real money. If you are in data center, you probably save that, like, you, you don't save money immediately. You, you, you take, get buy some time for, for the future, for future loads, but that's not immediately tangible. And also there is a, this uh, notion of like being modern that works not only for developers, like, like you who come to meetups, but also on the business level. When you, when people, sales people go to customers, they really want to tell that they are like on the cloud and uh, all the buzzwords. That also works on a business level. Maybe less on IT because uh, they are used to their servers and then they don't, they're not that big fans of cloud. But of course it takes quite some learning, so. Uh, the decision was made, we, we moved to Azure partly because we used a lot of other Microsoft technologies and we had like Office 365 and we, we know them. Partly because we just had a small project already running in Azure and we had some skills in house. But that was the decision that within a year we have to move to Azure, whatever happens. Did you also consider other uh, cloud providers here? We considered, but I wouldn't say seriously. Uh, the other branch of Astrata are running on AWS but they were not pushing us into anything and then it's just matched, matched everyone's expectations and we just said Azure. We did not really run in competitive analysis, price analysis, no. 
So there are basically two strategies. Uh, we used both uh, for lower level networking, like connecting to operators, uh, like mobile operators and third parties. They do a lot of things like VPNs and custom network configuration and that kind of things. So there, that part of, of the system, they just took the existing VMs from, from the data center, <coughs> deployed them to Azure, and uh, it runs as is. It, it sounds simple, but it actually took them many months to figure out all the configurations that you have to do so that it actually works. So it's not as trivial. Networking is hard, uh, even for people who know them. But for our own internal applications, we decided that we want to leverage PaaS or platform as a service as much as possible. So we converted all of our application blocks into Azure PaaS services. And that basically means that you leverage a lot of the cloud. On this diagram, it's only application. Of course, there are different things to configure and deploy and monitor and so on. But uh, basically, they handle all their infrastructure for you, and then you run on top of everything set up and ready. Before you start, I would certainly advise to have a strategy, ideally written down and agreed by everyone. We kind of did it, but it, it wasn't perfect, I would say. But at least we, we tol told us ourselves how we are going to, to approach cloud, that PaaS is better than IIS, so you, we will use it anytime we can, and SaaS or software as a service is even better. So for example, we used to host maps ourselves on our service, and now we switch to a web service provided by third party. That's an example of SaaS. So leverage as much as possible, don't do heavy lifting, do what we are good uh, in our business and uh, outsource all the rest. Then every team, we have not many, just like three teams, they decide for themselves what exactly they're going to do, how their application is going to run, which resources to provision. Of course, there is like a budget limit, but they decide how exactly their application should look like. And then leverage automation as much as possible, so script everything, or rather use resource things, uh, Azure things like IRM, uh, leverage continuous integration, continuous delivery, and also the elasticity of the cloud, so being able to scale up and down based on demand. Uh, of course, the first question was how much is, is it going to cost? That, that's a difficult one. There is a Azure pricing calculator. It's relatively useful if you know how to use it. You pick several services that you are going to use. For every service, you say, like, I want this tier, and on average, this amount of instances, and then it will give you a, a price back. And then you do it for every service that you're going to use and give, get a number back. Like, if that's just an example. It's not our. Uh, <laughs> but ours is more. Um, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, but of course, reliability of this depends on what, what like, uh, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't know what to put there, you will not get a reliable estimate. So, several ways to improve it. First, you need to learn. What that means, if you first time open this page, you will just don't you don't know what to select there and what what are the, all those buzzwords. Then it helps to run something in Azure actually to do it cheaper on small scale, just to learn what kind of costs you get. We've heard people complaining about high network costs because you pay for for traffic. For us, it's just almost zero. But on contrast, for example, application sites appear to be quite an expensive service. So you, you wouldn't know that until you run something on Azure, something comparable. And then ideally, you should try and put your application uh, into the cloud for a week or so, run some workload which would be comparable to production. Then you will get the actual estimate. But of course, probably it's not realistic to do it on day one of of, of So it's a We did all of that. But uh, the measure part was far after the, the decision point. Okay, so the, the implementation, where I stand on time. Okay. Again, the, the building blocks that we have, we have uh, a couple of APIs. Uh, backend API talks to devices, frontend API talks to frontend user website and the mobile applications. And then 
Backend API puts all the data into queues. There are queue processors which write to databases. And on top of that, there is uh, an infrastructure to monitor everything because we run 24 seven and uh, we have quite extensive monitoring and every downtime is a problem for, for customers. And uh, there is deployment that you just have to have in order to reliably uh, continue your change in application and uh, innovation. I'll, I'll take these blocks one on one and then explain what we changed and how easy or difficult that was. SQL Server is a favorite part. Uh, so when I say SQL Server, it's not just the software that you run on your uh, laptop, but it's uh, two, at least two servers, node A and node B for redundancy. If one fails, it switches over to the other. It sets storage sharing uh, networks of a basic storage on, on the fiber, which is very expensive. It connects to both of them. And then uh, you don't want to lose your data in, in case of disaster, so you also have a backup device which sits outside the data center, and uh, you have to buy all of that. The servers are quite high profile. That's a screenshot from Perfmon of, of one of those. I think it's 40 core, 128 gigabyte kind of machine, and it's somehow not doing anything on this screenshot. Uh, so that, that kind of hardware, if you are to move this to Azure three or four years ago, this wasn't possible. They just didn't have SQL servers of that size. Now they have much bigger servers, so it, it kind of feels safe. You'll just end up paying a lot. Uh, to give an idea of what our database looks like, uh, the biggest one is 700 gigs. That's important because I'll show you later. Uh, a lot of tables, a lot of stored procedures, so there were talks like that. Let's rewrite everything to, to, to Cosmos DB or something. Uh, not going to happen in uh, several years. Uh, we decided to migrate to uh, Azure SQL Database, which is fully managed service by Azure. There are no servers there. You just press a button or run a script, and then you get a connection stream. You connect to that connection, connection stream, and it just works. You cannot really RDP or configure that server. You don't know what's running there. There is no nodes, failovers, or whatever. That's all managed for you. They have cool features around uh, backup and restore. So you don't have to do your own backups unless you are paranoid and uh, don't trust Microsoft. They backup continuously, and then uh, you can restore to any point in time. So you say, this minute last week, I want to restore my database. And you can also restore it to for example, another data center or another region. And it will work. It will take some time before it is restores, but it will work. So that's a very good feature also for disaster recovery. If your Asia region is down or, I don't know, it blows up in Amsterdam, you can, at least in several hours, get a copy in, in Germany or in Ireland. Uh, it's automatically redundant and you can also control the level of redundancy, regional redundancy or cross-regional. You pay for cross-regional, of course. It's like two SQL servers, but that's possible. And you don't have to buy anything. You just pay every, every month, you pay a fee. You don't buy licenses. You can also bring your own licenses to the, to the question uh, and reduce the monthly costs. But uh, we couldn't do this because of our, the way our licenses from Qualcomm were set up. I'm, I'm not good at licensing and laws and stuff. But basically, we, we had to buy another license on top of our license to be able to do this, and that doesn't make sense. So uh, it depends on the type. Like If you bought it recently, I think you can move it. If you bought it like five years ago, they made a trick somewhere. It just, it just doesn't work. Um, still, it's, it's not fully automated, not, not fully magic. You need to pick a tier, performance level. And then it's hard to change it. In theory, there is a button that's easy, but then it kind of takes a lot of time. They replicate a new server, and then they switch over, and that can fail. It's not, I don't feel comfortable doing it in, on production. Uh, you have to provision disk space. It has maximum, at least. And then if you go beyond, then uh, it blows up. You still have to maintain indexes and statistics and that kind of thing, so DBA work kind of, uh, kind of load. And then some features of full SQL Server are not supported. I'll show later. The price. 
Uh, there are basic and standard tiers. They are crap for any uh, performance uh, applications or performance demanding applications. So we used uh, premium tier. There is also a new model where you provision cores and memory separate, but it's in preview, so I don't know it. We cannot run in production. And on premium, first thing to note is that it starts with 400 euros and stops at 13,000 euros per month for one server, one database. Uh, and also, if your database is more than one terabyte, you are kind of screwed because you have to buy P11 uh, for 6K. We, 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 we manage to fit. We feel comfortable. We will not grow too fast, but uh, that's, uh, that's uh, one warning. And another problem with this is that it's measured in DTUs, which are like virtual units of performance, which you don't know what they mean. Nobody can explain it to you. <laughs> you just know that one is two times more, so probably it's two times more performant. That's all. Uh, to know which one you, you need, you need to measure. There is a tool from Microsoft that, that you run on your SQL server on premises, and then it will tell you, ah, you need P6. That, that's all that it tells or the amount of DTUs. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. We, we ran it, it gave us some level, but uh, it, it turned out to be a bit low, like one level lower. So we didn't, I don't know how it works. It measures I.O. and CPU and memory and, and, and guesses, but they don't guarantee anything. So uh, to actually know, we, we ran our own uh, workload in, in Azure to, to actually calculate this before production. The way it works, we listen, we have a trace running, uh, listening for production SQL server. It traces all the commands. It, it throws them into a message queue like event hub. And then there is an Azure function which listens to that and they replace all the traffic on Azure SQL real time and throws away all the, all the results. It's like a thousand commands per second so there is a standard tool which does that. It, it blowed up. It couldn't keep up. So we wrote this ourselves. That's like two days of work. And then you get real-time performance and all these queries from production. Of course, you have to restore your production database first on, on SQL, on Azure. And that gave us a very good estimate. Basically, we, we calculated and then we, we could move and it was the same. So that, that schema works. I have a block if you want to below. Uh, so what are the limitations that I mentioned? First, there are no distributed transactions. Transactions work within one database. If you want uh, something like MSDTC, you, are, you cannot do this. It does, it's not supported. We loved distributed transactions. We, we still love them, but we don't use them anymore. Uh, then uh, anybody heard of service broker? OK, I'll skip that one. You don't need it. It's based, I'll touch it later. Also, you could run CLR, like C-sharp code inside SQL Server. That's like the most expensive <laughs> server in the world to run your C-sharp code. But you could, and we did. And that's not possible in Azure because of security, I guess. Uh, there are no linked servers. There are, you can do remote queries, but they are not exactly, don't provide the same guarantees, like, uh, again, transactions, and they fail sometimes. And also, you, uh, not that nice thing that you cannot just restore your database from bug file. It doesn't work. You have to use Azure SQL specific tools for that. And that affects migration, because for migration, they suggest two scenarios. First, you shut down your old SQL server. So you stop traffic from it. You make something called export, basically export the whole database in the file. And then you import your database into Azure SQL. And then you run your, produc your production traffic to the new SQL. When you, we measured th this, it took us like two days to, to make, so two days of downtime. We, we cannot do this. Uh, that's very expensive. So there is a second scenario. That's a fancy picture from, from Microsoft. But uh, what happens here, you spin up a new SQL server, which is called distributor. Your old SQL server becomes a publisher. Distributor, basically, you do your replication. It listens for a publisher and immediately publishes to subscriber. Then you run it for long enough so that it catches up, and it, then it's live. And then you shut down the publisher. You wait until it gets all the transactions, and you just redirect the traffic. So 
So that worked. We used it for production migration. It's like uh, 10 minutes of downtime, ideally. It's not that easy because uh, a lot of technical things, but you cannot replicate all of, of the stuff. And then after it's done, you have to run some maintenance scripts to actually mark your indexes as production ready and uh, <coughs> rebuild a little bit and blah, blah, blah. So it's quite a journey. And the total downtime was like half an hour, but it's still much, much better than uh, and this thing. And you, usually when you migrate it from no normal SQL servers, you would take a full backup, and then you would take differential backup, and you would restore the backup the, the previous day, and then differential backup is small. But you cannot, you cannot do the SQL server Azure. Right. And now for SQL uh, web servers, that's an easier story. Basically, uh, we have several uh, web APIs. ASP.NET APIs. Uh, two of them are public, one for backend, one for frontend. Everybody can access them from anywhere in the world. And then we have a number of other servers and uh, APIs which sit inside the far firewall boundary, the, the previous situation. And the firewall is nice, secure, so those API talk to each other through unsecure channels. No, no, no JWTs or no HTTPS even. We moved to Azure App Service, no brainer choice, a fully managed uh, Azure service to run your .NET code. It can run web, can run background jobs. Awesome. Very simple to use, very simple to deploy. It scales up, scales out. So we, in this time, you can actually change the, your life, like upscale it to a bigger instance that works fine. It has scale out, so based on your load, you can define if CPU is more than 70, I can spin up a new instance. That's great. And WCF that we used extensively on are just work, just work there. No problems. The problem is that app service is always public, so we cannot make it private. It's always on, on the internet. There is actually app service environment that when they put you into a sandbox, but it costs three or four times more, so it's really expensive. Uh, so we had actually to secure all the internal channels with HTTPS and client certificates. So every service doesn't trust anyone anymore, anyone. It's relatively easy with WCF if you do it in HTTPS, uh, but took a couple of weeks to set up proper certificate and trust it and uh, IP restrictions and so on. So that's where work came most. Overall, it was easy. The queues. Uh, we have like 50 queues or something like that. And we shoot ourselves in the foot in the sense that for queuing, we also used SQL Server. Uh, the hardcore way to do this is just with custom tables. I, I know a lot of people do this still. We, we do this still. But uh, also in Azure. Uh, but uh, the bigger and more high load queues were done with SQL, SQL Server Service Broker. It's a cool technology which Basically, a queue inside of your SQL Server, again, one of the most expensive queue in the world, queues in the world because you pay licenses. But it works marvelously because it sits inside the same process. It, there is no latency. It can throw thousands of messages per second without any issues. Very reliable. It, they are part of transactions, so you commit and you commit the queues as well. So very high level programming model. Very hard to use. As everything with SQL, you write SQL for queues. But with some layer on top of that, it worked reasonably well. But that doesn't work in Azure at all. And a lot of processors handling those queues were CLR store procedures, which don't work in Azure. So we had to change everything, uh, kind of make a new abstraction layer, and uh, abstract everything to Azure Service Bus. Uh, that worked, took some, some time to, to put abstractions against client setter. It doesn't provide all those guarantees. You cannot do real transactions with service bus. There are some transactions, but not, not with SQL. Uh, so you lose uh, manageability and uh, guarantees, so you have to code around it. That takes time. 
Uh, also with service bus, we had a lot of performance challenges. Uh, like we started with standard tier. Standard tier is a game for, for somebody just sending several messages per, per minute, I guess. It's very slow. It, you kind of get noisy neighbor effects sometimes, like somebody is playing on your server and then you are, you are slow. And we had to rewrite a lot of things to batch more aggressively because there is latency now. You cannot send message one by one. You'll get tens of milliseconds of latency, so it gets very slow. We batch as much as possible. Batching is limited by message size, which is now one megabyte with premium service bus. Service broker was sending 18 minutes of batches, no issue. And uh, also, we had some calls with uh, Azure engineers, architect, I don't know who they are, because we were constantly seeing decay in performance of service bus over time. You run your application today, it works fast. In two weeks, it's two times slower, something like that. You recreate service bus namespace, it runs fast. In two weeks, it's slower. They fixed something, we fixed something, we found the configuration where it works, and we don't touch it anymore, but <laughs> that, that, that's a bit scary. So if I were to start today for, for that kind of workload, probably things like event hubs would be more promising because they are designed for performance. Uh, Q processors, um, that's where all the .NET code sits, apart from APIs and uh, WCF. Uh, again, we, we were hosting some of that code inside SQL Server. We don't anymore, but that's just a switch from Windows Server to a console application because we are using something called App Service Web Jobs. It's the same Azure App Service, but basically it runs any of the console application that you provide to it as a background task. And then it's a, really any console application. We don't use Web Job SDK if you know that one. A bit of uh, Brain teasing was how to use it properly because you can have multiple app services. That's a scale unit. Your per performance limit, uh, uh, you have multiple of those. But then you can have multiple web jobs per each app service, and you can process multiple queues in each web job. First, we started with like making one on one, so making one queue processor in a web job. But that's a new .NET instance, and that's very resource consuming. So in the end, we hosted all our queue processors inside one single web job. The bad thing about this is that you cannot stop, 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 start them separately or configure them separately out of the box. But we made a small configuration layer, like in app setting or in SQL, you can put a flag and then it stops. That was manually. If you if you if you starting this from scratch, you can try web job SDK. It has all this out of the box, but. Legacy code is kind of hard to fit into that. Uh, monitoring. So we're in a previous life, we were using a third-party tool called PRTG. Probably you have never heard of it. But it's, uh, uh, it, it's a management platform where you can create sensors. We have about 2,000 or 3,000 sensors, which monitor everything from CPUs, RAM consumption, and that low-level stuff to business metrics. And the business metrics are the most important, like how many messages we get from this device, or what's the queue for that customer. Or it's, it's mostly it's SQL queries or custom performance counter in a C-sharp application. And that tool integrates them nicely and provides some dashboard uh, on top of that. And very important alerts, because we run 24-7. We have standby team. If something goes, if a sensor goes out, down and it's an important one, Somebody gets a SMS and then gets wake up and uh, fixes it. We needed to keep this in Azure. Uh, Azure has a lot of monitoring tools at first glance, like Azure Monitor, which collects data from Azure services, log analytics for logs, application insights for custom stuff that you write mostly, or also for monitoring the net applications. But we, we, we didn't solve this puzzle in a way that we only used Azure services. They all work on their own, and uh, combining them sort of possible, but especially for custom metrics, which we write, we write ourselves, there isn't really good solution which solves alerting and uh, dashboards and everything. So we, we kind of ended up doing mixed things. Yeah, they also do dashboards, which kind of suck. 
because they are not configurable enough and sometimes they show wrong data. Uh -huh. uh, so our setup, we, we use Grafana for, for uh, front end. Everybody, anybody knows Grafana? Yeah, or awesome. I thought it's just <coughs> for Java people, or that kind of audience. We use Grafana for, for front end. Grafana can connect nicely to Azure Monitor. It can connect also to PRTG, which, which is great for us. And then the setup looks a bit like this. So Grafana just showing data, and then uh, custom metrics are still working through PRTG, so our old software. And then all alerting is also done through PRTG, and that's why PRTG also takes data from Azure, which was the biggest missing link in this schema because PRTG doesn't know what Azure, so we had to kind of write our translation layer ourselves with functions. Uh, basically, PRTG can ping HTTP endpoint like like from a, from a previous session live, and then health back, or something more advanced. And then then it, uh, that endpoint can go to Azure and request the data from Azure Monitor. That's our own endpoint. And then it kind of works. There is another blog post there. Uh, deployments. Uh, the previous setup before. Azure looked like this. Somebody RDPs to an operator machine, then runs a PowerShell script, which copies all the files from some pre prepared folder, stops, stops, starts all the services. And uh, a very nice tool we used for SQL, uh, SQL compare. Anybody knows that? It, it's very cool. It's quite expensive, I think, but uh, yay, we had the licenses. Uh, so it, it, for, for those who don't know, it, you, write, you manage your, all your scripts in the folder, and then you say desired state of MySQL server is this, all the tables, all the stored procedures, indexes. And then this tool will go and compare your real database with your folder, show you all the differences, and then ask you, would, would you like to apply them? You still need to write some custom migrations for data and so on, because it's not smart enough to understand how you change the shape. But for uh, keeping SQL clean, especially when you have like 600 stored procedures, it's a very handy tool. And they have a backend which runs without UI for five times price, I think, so that you could integrate it with your CI CD pipeline. But you can also do it using database to project I don't think it would it worked i think we tried it and uh, there were problems with it it wasn't smart enough or we didn't maintain it properly or uh, i remember hearing about it i don't think i tried tried it myself but Yeah, yeah. It, it's quite. It's actually quite smart. It no, it calculates the order that it has to apply things. It it that makes it reliable, like copying first the temporary table, and uh, it does a lot of smart stuff. It works almost always, so it's good if you can, if you have the money. It's a good tool. I'm, I'm sure it's better than uh, Visual Studio. Then for deployment, we started using Octopus Deploy. Uh, nothing really specific about Azure, but it works good with Azure. Just coincidence that we started using it. We, we decided to take this opportunity to also upgrade our uh, deployment pipeline. So we do everything in Octopus, including ARM templates, so the, the definition of the cloud environment. So we can spin up a new environment, for example, for automated testing, run the tests, and then spin it down. And that all works, just one button click in Octopus. And production deploy is also button click, if you're brave enough. Uh, so the ARM templates are Azure Resource Manager templates. That's the one uh, Jason I showed before. You can define all Azure resources in templates, and you have some parameters to parameterize it for different environments. 
we did all this job, it turns out to be much easier than it sounds. Sometimes it's hard to like find the proper parameters and so on, but there are tricks to this, like see what Azure generates. If you go to the portal, to the resource that you created manually, you can see ARM template. It's full of crap, like it's they create too much stuff there, but you can always find one parameter that you need and then copy paste it into your template and that, that works. So it's 4, 4K of JSON, very relatively readable as JSON, so it's not code, but uh, it's okay. And uh, the nice thing again that you described just the desired configuration and then the tool will actually uh, compare it to your Azure and then with some rules will apply the changes. It, it's not as perfect as SQL compare I would say. Sometimes it, it misses something but if you know the, the rules basically you know how to use it and uh, it works especially for reliably reproducible uh, environments that you need to provision more often than once. Uh, a big debate as, in, as for any developer in code for, for Azure, like how, how we go into to name our resources. Uh, a good advice is to be smart and don't debate about this, but create a lot of subscriptions and then give every team a new subscription if you can and they let them do whatever they want. That I think that what I, I would recommend because whatever naming convention you pick up, somebody will be unhappy. We, we do this and it's, it sucks basically. <laughs> you have three, three characters for everything like production and then app service plan if you can find ASP there somewhere in between. And then uh, some semantic names for application and component and then just a number in the end. So we have SQL 001 and 002 and 003. And then somebody says, oh, I'll connect to 004 because I know uh, the data are there. It's, it's a bit difficult. We don't use dashes because some resources do not, allow to, do not allow to use dashes, like two of them in Azure, and that's why we decided we don't use dashes. Also, also stupid, I would say. But you have to like, read, read the metrics with this a little bit. Uh, Saver is good, saver is tagging. You can tag every resource and then we use tags for environment production, staging, application, role, who's the owner, just random comment. And then you can search in the portal, you can filter on this, uh, you can give, per, yeah, based on tags, probably not permissions, but it, it simplifies life a little bit. And you see costs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can see costs per tag, yeah, that's a good point. But again, I would we are using one subscription for almost everything, maybe two subscriptions. Subscriptions are basically free. So if you set up your account properly, you can create as many subscriptions as you can. And then that's a good way to isolate things uh, between the teams, for example. Uh, conclusions, nine o'clock, time to wrap up. So. Uh, was it doable? Yes, we did it last year, last month. It works on production, the trans in Azure. Was it easy? No, we, we spent like eight months of, well, not continuous effort, but somebody was all constantly doing something to get us closer to migration. So it takes time and a lot of cost in this sense of ours. Uh, but I would, my advice would be uh, to leverage this moment if you are in this position uh, to switch yourself a little bit to use managed services to clean up the dev because you get budget for, for, for everything. You can also do, do some abstractions and delete some depre deprecated stuff. Invest highly into CI, CD, continuous integration, and infrastructure as code. That's in the cloud work, that's very important. Uh, did we have to pay anything in advance? No, except for testing, but is it cheap? No, again, it's quite expensive. If you say, we'll save money from day one, in most cases, that's gonna be wrong. But then the hope is that you can optimize it later or use elasticity more aggressively. I think our cost is still comparable to what we had. Nobody knows the numbers. Again, it's, it's hard to compare a five-year-old service with monthly bill in Azure. But it's one order of magnitude, I would say. And don't forget to include like learning time, engineering time, testing time. We pay for test servers. Uh, and some consultants, business law consultants, so, and they are expensive. Uh, a positive example on the pricing side, like in, in uh, May, I think it was built, they made this 
article with a long name, revised scaling experience, whatever. But the, the key point was that they reduced the price for app service that we used by 20%. So you save 20% just next day. Probably we were paying too much before that, but that's another story. <laughs> But that, that, that kind of, that good, sells good for, for business and like, uh, okay, now we, sa we save a thousand euro per month. Hey, just without doing anything. Uh, is cloud fully managed? Yes. Is it always up? Unfortunately, no. There are two types of outage. We saw both of them. If you go to the Azure history, you can filter on your region, for example, and then see a long list of what happened when. They try to be transparent. My experience is that they don't always want to show you everything, all, all the problems that they had. I saw people pushing them into publishing some stuff that, and like sending screenshots. And then it was appearing in, in this log, but okay. And then, uh, but basically when Azure is down, you just open Twitter, you, 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 you get yourself a coffee and, and go there. That's a real screenshot of Azure outages, uh, Azure support Twitter. Like. You, just hang out and wait until it's back. Maybe, maybe log something for your customers. And uh, it actually helps when you were down for two hours, we have to issue some document to our biggest customer, why, what happened. And if you just send them, not this, but uh, uh, a formal statement from Azure, it's kind of easier to sell to them because they understand. But the other type is when Azure is fine, but your, your resource is down. And then you start calling them, and you really don't know what, what will happen. You will get one engineer. So investing in good support plan, that's important. It costs money, but you get somebody on the phone at least uh, within one, one hour or so. And uh, we had issues with uh, service bus, as I said. Our SQL database was disappeared twice. Like, there is no. <laughs> It was it was back it was back after the call, but uh, you go you you get timeouts you get monitoring alerts you go to the portal and there is no database there. Like, okay, and then they had a the nice email where they said there were some race condition and blah 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 and it's gonna be fixed in December. But then it, and then you were extremely unlucky to get it. That's uh, edge case and then we got it next week. So we thought we should buy some lottery ticket. Uh, things happen. Uh, be prepared that cloud is not a panacea for 100% of time. At least you don't have to solve it yourself. So did you, did you set up a deal with them for the uh, No, not yet. So we, we our, our data backups, they go everywhere. Well, that's it of SQL Server in Azure. So you can restore a second instance in different region. So that's our plan. Uh, to restore it, it will take several hours, but we'll, we'll be running within five hours, I think. Again, in different region with uh, minimal data loss, like five minutes, I think. But it will take that downtime. We don't have automatic failover to different region because for SQL, it's kind of easy, but then you need to set up more things on higher levels, like also your applications and then switchovers. That's all manual, and then all the info around it. So it's it's a bit more complicated. No, no plan at the moment. Probably not not right now. Uh, we do, but we, the problem is that we migrated just last month, so uh, uh, we, we do have numbers for the previous life. I think they are not public, so I, I wouldn't share them. But if we have SLAs with our customers. And uh, I, my prediction is that downtime is going to be still caused by us, mostly. Like Azure, it happens, but it's rare. Yes, I, I'll just turn this slide on, and then you can ask questions. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering, for, for the things that were not supported by Azure that were using before, did you consider using a hybrid solution, like see some stuff? 
Uh, yeah, yes, a good example is that one database was using a lot of Azure SQL Server Broker custom code, and that was kind of hard to, to migrate to anything. So the plan was to use something called Azure Managed SQL Instance. That's like they install the full SQL Server in, in the cloud and they manage it for you, kind of. It's not that service that you use, so you can use anywhere anything there, but you're it's a different pricing model and different maintenance model. And it appeared to be quite hard to set it up and uh, make it runnable. So we just invested more time into refactoring. But that was a question. Like, We did not consider cross, like keeping stuff in our, on the December, because we basically have a contract until December. And then we are either pay or get out. So we, the mix could be possible, but it wasn't a good solution. Also, you get like cross data center issues. So, one one application is still runs in the old data center because we have time until December, but it, it's a small one. Yes. Should should I throw that thing? Or oh, yeah, that that should be fun. <laughs> and we need to throw it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Uh, I was curious, actually, how did you manage the uh, development life cycle of the application? Like you mentioned, it took you eight months to migrate from here to there. But did you have your team dedicated eight months for just migration? What no. about the application features and bug fixing and stuff like that? No, it, it, there were several stages, like first price evaluation and uh, architecture and documents and that kind of stuff. So we, there were a couple of people involved part time and then we had some consultants helping us. And then uh, the later, the more resources we put into this. Uh, like there were, on average, I would say at this time, there were one or two developers working on this full time-ish. So the, the, the other team members could continue other stuff. But that was a big like attention. Uh. OK, but then, but then you get some sort of synchronization issues, right? If you implement uh, a new uh, CLR or SQL function, in the normal SQL during the eight months, and then you need to work on migrating that to Azure. Yeah, kind of. But as soon as we discover we cannot use them, we we communicate it to everybody. Like, don't do this anymore. These issues were actually solved on uh, earlier stages preparation a little bit, uh, so they were not they were not intense. Like, we had enough time to to to, to prepare this code and explain everybody how how we should do this. And later on, more issues like product, running production testing, uh, load testing, uh, functional testing, changing some broken parts, and so on. Fixing bug with, uh, bugs with uh, missing transactions, for example. That kind of effort which we couldn't pr predict once. That was more eating our time. You don't have a box, you cannot talk. <laughs> <laughs> Can you catch? <laughs> okay. It works. Have you used the feature of Azure Active Directory? Uh, like, uh, my question is, that was not covered here. So if, if normally in an organization we use Active Directory for authentication, how did you migrate all the users from Active Directory to Microsoft Azure AD? We use it for our internal users. So the, the, all, the whole organization is in Azure AAD. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I didn't work on this. I'm not an IT guy. I don't know. I think it was relatively straightforward. I think we even did this before this year because we already use Office 365 and uh, all that kind of stuff. And it somehow integrates magically. But I'm no, not, I'm not in. No? <laughs> okay, then somebody did a good job because it was very. Yeah, because the roles are different. The, the, all the. Frankly, I'm not good in that, but for me it just worked. So. <laughs> <laughs> but for external customers, we don't use AD. We, we use some internal authentication, legacy okay. stuff. And regarding your performance related slide, how did you mitigate all those things, problems which you shown in, in your slide? Which one? Uh, for the performance challenges in my Azure. Ah, service bus. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of explained that we, we bought 
like the biggest tier we can with with the money that we can, and then with with Azure engineers found the solution with configuration and and that kind of stuff. There are multiple knobs and, and which are not very intuitive for us uh, mere mortals, but they know some hints. Okay, so do you recommend Microsoft Azure as the cloud provider, or there are other better cloud providers? <laughs> yeah, I'm oh, right. I just, uh, want to, that was. <laughs> 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 yes, I do. Okay, okay. But uh, frankly, I have more experience with Azure, so uh, it's it, it's good. They are working hard to make it as good as possible, for sure. Recently, they recently became the biggest. Okay. I think yeah, they in, I, I think they cheat a bit, like including Office 365 and uh, oh, yeah. that kind of things. <laughs> That's everything which is not in data center cloud, and yes. They are, they are doing a good job. But uh, the downsides a little bit were those issues with Azure SQL and Service Bus, which are the old services. We are not like running Kubernetes things or, or serverless. They are relatively old. They change it all the time still, and you get those problems. We felt sometimes that we are somewhere a bit on the edge. Maybe we are advanced to use case or I don't know. Pick this box. Yes. Take, take the box. Do you have, uh, uh, is the pricing done over a contract of multiple years? You can. Because I thought, well, what you can you do? You've done all this migration, and then they raise the prices. You can choose. For some services, you can reserve them, they call it. Right. You get a discount. You can do it for one year or three years. And then you get some discount, but you basically promise to pay this every month. You don't have to pay in advance, but you say, I'm, I will pay at least this for SQL. I think it doesn't work for SQL yet, but you can. But for otherwise, pricing are not guaranteed. They can increase them, but I believe it that didn't happen a single time yet. So they are in a race, uh, arm race with, uh, with Amazon and uh, Google. And they decrease prices, but I don't think they ever increase them. I'm not sure. But maybe there are exceptions, but yeah. That wasn't a big concern, at least for us, I don't know. Maybe they can, but that, that's kind of, it's going to be a headline of the news if, if they do it, I, I'm yeah. pretty sure. Well, I, I just think, of course, now there's competition that they're trying to get new people in. Yeah. If once everybody's on Azure, then. <laughs> well, everybody's not going to be on Azure. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Anyone? Thank you. So you mentioned that. Um, Using Azure allow, allows to do some uh, cost uh, performance, uh, like reduce costs by tweaking some stuff. But in my experience, when developers are given opportunity to play around with cloud, they just spin up a lot of resources, oh, forget yes. about them. Oh yes. Especially for non-production environments, and then in the end, company like just pays a lot of money, and nobody is using these resources. In the end, do you have? Did you have this problem? How did you overcome it? So we are relatively small now. We are not Qualcomm anymore. So we, we do it more or less manually. People look at the bill and ask, uh, because of those tags, they can easily break, break it down by environment, team, and so on. And then it's, it's not formal. There is no approval process or anything. They just look at it, and then they ask, why are you spending all this money? But uh, uh, for example, I was on Cloud Brew conference in Belgium, and there was an architect from Mar Maersk, or what, what's the right name, like the, the huge company which does containers, like proper containers, not 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 Docker, but <laughs> 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 physical containers, ship ship containers. And he was explaining how they introduced Azure in their company, and he was talking about cloud strategy, and then then balance between giving freedom to people and managing what they do, like. The guardrails, guardrails, he called that. I think it's online. He, he has come some good insights uh, about that for big organization. They basically create policies on Azure subscription level, what people can and cannot do. And it still feels free, but they cannot violate some security rules or cost restrictions. Or, but developers, for sure, they will spin up as much as they can and then just leave it running forever. Yes. Run out of money very quickly. 
I think you can also put budgets on, on Azure, but you probably don't want to do this on something like production because you're out of money and then. <laughs> Sorry, out of money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that people, there was a story from, from Google, I think, Cloud, they, when they just switched off one big customer because they didn't, they delayed their invoice payment for several days. And like, that's normal in corporate world to delay your payments. But they just shut them down and there was a big scandal. So, yeah, that's that's not nice. I think there is a like Azure Advisor or some some service which, if you go there, they will actually try to show you which resources you you are not using and how you can save cost by deleting them. And it like feels that they are cutting money from their own pocket, but uh, their strategy is to make you long term happy and not not waste resources. So that's. You can go there and see. You could downscale your VM because last month it was never above CPU 30 or something like that. It could also like uh, implement strategy that all your infrastructure is uh, provisioned by code. By doing so, you uh, have, the, have a set environment that every day at 5 o'clock or whenever your company uh, closes go. You delete every resource that is Yeah, for for test temporary temporary yeah, environments yeah. that everybody leaves behind, that's a good strategy. Yeah. Lock resources. Yeah. You can put locks so that they cannot be deleted yeah. without removing the lock first. And that's a separate role or separate command. All right. Any more yes, one more. You can also ask them afterwards if you yeah. if you have some more. So I see you went for web jobs, right? Why didn't you go for um, functions? which seems to be web jobs, the next generation. Like if you go to my web blog, you will only see blog posts about functions and that, that much of a fun for of functions. Okay, which But no. they are very hard for legacy code. Like it's, it takes a lot of engineering when we kind of thought of this. It's not realistic for our work, like for our code uh, that we have because they have opinionated model how you define your functions and they do well, our jobs do more or less the same what function would do but they have this structure and uh, for service bus for example that simply not all features of service bus are supported for example session sessions are not supported on functions batching is a bit less you have less control over batching that kind of stuff thank you, thank you.